Well, this is neat, isn't it? Holy jumpers. What's going on here? Whew. How do you guys like that ride? All right. Everybody's ready to go here. So signal transmission systems, uh, starting out pretty basically here, the, the whole idea of this uh, complete section is the overview of how and what signals are used for data transmission, uh, how things get from A to B. Uh, it gets rather involved uh, in terms of different types of uh, protocols and things like that. When I first started teaching the communications course, uh, I, I did it the first time a few years ago, five years ago or something like that. And I kind of I likened it to being uh, chosen by God to hand out cancer. It's not a particularly fun uh, section, but it gives us a, a really good background onto the hows and whys uh, that signal systems operate on and why we choose the ones that we do choose on. Uh, it goes quite deeply uh, into the different types of protocols, uh, generally a little deeper than we need to go, um, but excellent background information and it applies a lot of the information in this uh, unit will apply to things outside of work as well. So let's uh, see if we can get this slideshow going here. How do I get my view, normal view? Oh, what the hell is going on here? All right, we'll just call it good. Everybody can hear me, everything's good? I can hear you, but I cannot see your screen. You cannot see the screen. I can I can hear you and see you. And can you see the PowerPoint? Yeah, you bet. Yeah, I can see it too. Okay, Michael, can you see the PowerPoint or not? Let me switch to the laptop then. I'm using my phone right now. That may be the issue. We'll get this worked out. Yeah, you go ahead. I switched to my laptop. It's okay. Okay. So objectives in this first ILM. Uh, describe signal transmission systems used for communication. So we'll talk about things like RS-232, uh, RS-485, a few different types of protocols. Uh, we'll talk about where and what types of applications these particular signal transmission systems use. Um, and basically describe all the basics of signal transmission systems, different types of uh, terminology and functions and types of signals. And the reason that we're doing this is because of course, data communications are used extensively uh, throughout process control systems and also in our everyday lives. So basically this ILM covers how data gets from A to B. So we'll start out with the different types of data transmission modes. And as most ILMs go, uh, we'll progress technologically as we talk about different protocols. So we'll do simpler protocols first and then gradually build on them. Um, and you'll see as we go through many of the different subjects, whether it's communication or process control or whatever it is. Can you turn off your mics? So that's what needs to be replaced. We don't have one. Uh, okay. I mean, I'm not sure. It'll be three to five days. We'll just pause there. for a second here. If, if you're not speaking, can you mute your mic? Perfect. Uh, anyway, as I was saying, most ILMs, as we as we go through the subject material, we usually start out with the, the lowest technology, and then we build on it, generally getting up to where technology is today. So that's the same thing that applies here in this communication module. We'll start out with the simplest type of data transmission methods, and then we'll build on them from there. And every increasing step usually brings uh, benefits and features that, uh, that take care of something that was missing in the earlier versions. So keep an eye on that as we go through here. So a signal transmission system is made up of software and hardware that provides rules and the channel for the data to move. So uh, modems, wires, and software, things like that. This channel may be wired or wireless, and we'll talk first about wired systems, and then we'll get into wireless systems a little bit later. 
Each of these different types of systems will have unique rules as to how it is transmitted and received. But a general system will look like we have here on the slide, some types of rules for the sending device, rules for the receiving device. Usually they're common between the two of them uh, in, this, in the particular technology. Um, we'll have hardware, we'll have some type of a transmission medium, and we'll start out with wired transmission, and then we'll talk about uh, wireless transmission. And then we have data that is getting sent from the transmitter to the receiver. And the way that the data is sent or packaged, uh, like we have here in envelope, changes as we go through the different types of protocols. And basically what happens with the data packaging um, as we step through the different types of protocols is we get greater amounts of data that are able to be transferred and we get better uh, quality data and better speed of data transfer as we progress through the technology. So those are the kinds of things that you're going to be looking for as we work our way through this PowerPoint here. Are, you, are these uh, slides changing as we flip through? Does it say modes on your screen now? Yeah. Sure does. Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. So we start out with three specific types of data transfer modes, and this is very grassroots type stuff, feet on the ground stuff. And they are called simplex, half duplex, and full duplex. And this is the way that the information is sent between the transmitter and the receiver. And anything you see in the PowerPoint here that is in uh, this orange color is related to a self-test question at the back. So I don't know if you're following along in your ILMs or not, but if you are and you wanna make your life easy later, highlight anything that you see that's orange in the PowerPoint in your ILM because that ties to one of the self-test questions. So we'll look at each of these communication modes uh, individually. And again, as I said earlier, they get progressively more complex as we talk about them. So the first mode, simplex, uh, sometimes called SX, uh, is single channel communication, similar to the way uh, a printer works at home. The data is only sent one direction from the transmitter to the receiver. So when you're at home and you are printing something, you're sending data from your computer to your printer and it prints it. The printer does not send any data back. So it's one way communication from transmitter to receiver. So very simple and straightforward. Second method here is called half duplex or HDX. And this is most relatable to the way that a walkie talkie works uh, in that only one person can talk at a time. So transmitting and receiving can be done both directions, but it, it is not simultaneous communication. What happens is like a walkie talkie, if you want to talk, you press a button, it transmits to the receiver, the receiver listens. When they're ready to talk, they press a button, the connection changes, and that data goes back to the uh, other, other receiver on the other end. So each end has a transmitter and receiver uh, built into it, and it switches back and forth. So very much like a walkie-talkie. And you'll see the third developmental step here called full duplex mode is just like a telephone. Uh, in that we can both talk at the same time. You see we have continuous paths both ways. So he can talk, he can receive, B can talk, A can receive. They can do this simultaneously. It's just like a telephone call, um, but it also comes with the same limitations that you have uh, with a telephone call. And that is that if you're impatient and you're not waiting for the other person to speak before you respond, you can get mixed messages. And we'll talk about how we deal with these mixed messages uh, in terms of data flow in a communication system, how, how we deal with keeping the messages from getting messed up. Okay, there are many different ways that that, that is transmitted in terms of waveforms. We know that there's radio waves that get sent through the, through the air. Um, and different ways that data gets packaged. From the first slide, you saw the little envelope. We put that information into a package and we send it to the receiver. The receiver unpacks that information, reads it, does something with it. Every protocol has a different type of package. Uh, they start out really simple and 
relatively small and they build as we go through them. Um, we'll talk about two specific types of signals. Um, the most common ones are broadband and baseband. And we'll define uh, what broadband and baseband are. Okay, baseband, long story short, is digital. It's wired, cannot travel through the air, and it uses something called time division multiplexing, which is not particularly important to you guys. But basically what it is, is a scheduler that tells each end when they can communicate. So it's like a multiplexer from third year that goes out there and it's one IO point that will go out there and pull a number of different devices asking for their information. When they get asked for their information, they send it back and then the next uh, device is asked for information and it goes through it one step at a time. Baseband has limits to the distance it can travel and that's limited basically to wire science and those of you with dual tickets uh, probably remember the LRC model for wires and the resistance and cross-sectional area and all that kind of good stuff. Um, those are the limitations that are involved with baseband signals um, but they can be extended using things called repeaters and the most common example of a baseband type of signal transmission system that we use today is Ethernet, which uses uh, Cat5 or Cat6e or whatever Cat it happens to be these days. Okay, broadband is similar to Heart, if you remember from last year, where we have a digital signal that is modulated or uh, hidden within a modulated signal that uses a modem and turns uh, analog when it's sent and then demodulated back to digital when it was received. An example of a broadband signal is cellular and it requires special equipment and that special equipment is really a modem. So the diagram that we have here that represents the uh, hardware and wiring in a broadband type signal We'll show you what's going on here. We have DTEs, which stands for data terminal equipment. So this would be your, your computer, for example. We have digital information that gets transferred from your computer to a DCE, which is a uh, data communication uh, data communication equipment, which represents, in our case, a modem. So we send ones and zeros back and forth between the modem and the computer. The modem takes that one and zero and transforms it into a, a modulated frequency, so like a sine wave that you would have gotten from Hart, and you remember that the frequency shift keying that Hart used where one frequency is a zero, one frequency is a, a one. So that's the job of the data communication equipment. It sends that radio type broadband signal through the air, or it could also be on wires, but through the air to the modem at the other end. That modem takes that modulated frequency signal converts it into a digital signal which then gets sent to the computer on the other end. So we have baseband or digital communication between the terminal equipment and the communication equipment and broadband communication between the two uh, communication equipment pieces or the, or the modems. Okay, so DCE, again, data communication equipment. This is what is used to convert baseband to and from broadband. And then DTE is the data terminal unit or the computer or the PLC, which sends data to the modem. Start out with serial communication, uh, the very fundamental uh, way of communicating. And it's, it's just like a serial uh, electrical circuit in that the information has to go through a loop and that has its benefits and its drawbacks and we'll try to address those. So many of you have taken a nine or 25 pin cable and hooked your printer up to the home computer. This is an example uh, of RS-232 standards. So pretty simple, it's fairly old technology. It's been around for a long, long time and it's still used today. Question? So what's the difference between RS-232, 485, and the 422? You just be patient, Mr. Michael, and we'll address that in a few slides. But more than, more than you want to know, trust me. 
Okay, common industrial connections of this type are usually between a PLC and a remote terminal unit. And those of you with SCADA experience probably use RS-232 or RS-485 or RS-422 uh, fairly regularly. It is an old technology, but it is a very reliable type of technology. So Michael, to answer your question, uh, as well as having RS-232, there's also 233, 485, and 422. And sadly, I am going to answer your question with more detail than you probably want. Okay, so when your computer sends the data to the printer, it's in little packets or frames, as we showed in the earlier slide. These are transmitted sequentially, one bit at a time, and then put together again at the printer or unpacked at the printer, and that data is converted into images that gets printed on the paper. How fast that data moves is quantified and qualified by a few different terms, and we are going to address these terms. Uh, you may have heard of the first one, or the, set, or the third one, probably not many people have heard of the second one, but we are going to look at what's called bit rate, characters per second, and baud rate. And these are ways of qualifying the speed that data is moving. So, bit rate, pretty self explanatory, is the number of bits sent per second. And you usually see it in bits per second as the unit. And a typical serial RS-232 data transfer method usually happens at about 1,200 bits per second. Characters per second is another way of defining it, and it's a little bit looser. Uh, and, and the key thing here is that in order to count characters per second, you actually have to define what is a character. And a character is a variable number that's assigned by whatever uh, situation or protocol that you're in. So if we say, for example, that a character is 10 bits, then we would say that serial communication would be 120 characters per second based on 1,200 bits. Hopefully you understand that. If every character is 10 bits, we divide this by 10, we end up with 120 characters per second. The number of bits can change based on the type of coding used. We don't get into it too far, but just know bit rate is bit rate, and that's pretty much a standard value. Characters per second will be based off a of bit rate value. And if I were to give you a question on it, I would say uh, a character equals 10 bits, or a character per, uh, equals eight bits, or a character equals six bits. And then you would just take that number and divide it into 1,200. So it's not very complicated. The third one <clears throat> you probably have heard before uh, is baud rate, uh, similar to characters per second, but it is technically called symbols per second, just another way of uh, defining it. And, and the symbol, again, can be any number of bits. So if a symbol, for example, is four bits, then the baud rate for serial would be 300 or 1200 divided by four. So bit rate character per, sec per second, and baud rate are the two, or sorry, the three um, terms that we use to define transmission speed. The next couple slides, we'll talk about uh, asynchronous and synchronous transmission. And you can relate to asynchronous and synchronous. Uh, it has to do with the timing. Uh, for example, uh, this course, is a synchronous course, meaning that it's a 10 week course and we're all on the same schedule. Uh, if this was a asynchronous course, it could be a 16 week course. For example, we do my 16 week course would be asynchronous. I'll do something when I feel like doing it and you'll do something when you feel like doing it. We're on different schedules. And that's really the basic difference between synchronous and asynchronous. It's Whose clock are we using? Are we sharing a clock? Or do we each have our individual clocks? So let's look at this here. So comparing synchronous to asynchronous. Asynchronous transmission requires that the transmitter and receiver each have their own clock for timing the messages. When they start timing is cued by something called a start bit. And you'll see what a start bit is when we start looking at the data frames. 
or packages and how they are put together. So they are also told when to stop by a stop bit, and that's also part of the data package or the frame that we'll talk about in a little bit here. So in order to work, the clocks have to be at the same frequency or the same time, basically. So I'll give you some perspective on what this kind of looks like. So student A walks, wants to talk to student B. They've arranged to talk at four o'clock, which was after class. At 3.59, student A looks at his watch or his phone and decides to call. Student B, at the same time, 3.59 on his watch or clock, is waiting for the call. Student A sends a start bit, which is the phone ringing or logic zero. Student B answers and they have a conversation. At the end, student A sends a stop bit, goodbye or logic one. He hangs up. Student B gets the stop bit, says goodbye, and hangs up. Hopefully, that makes some sense. If their clocks are off by half an hour, they would miss the call. So that's the problem with asynchronous communication is that they're each on their own clock. And if their clocks aren't timed properly or synchronized with each other, the message may or may not get through. So that's the downside to asynchronous. Synchronous transmission, both ends use the same clock and they are always in sync. So as you can see, asynchronous has its drawbacks, synchronous a little bit better because it ensures that they're always in sync. Okay, so difference between synchronous and asynchronous. Asynchronous sender and receiver have different clocks or different timings and synchronous, they share the same timer. So here's our first look at a frame or a data packet and here's how they are built. So you'll see here, we have a start bit, a bunch of data and this will vary by protocol RS-232, RS-422, RS-485. This part will change in terms of how much data that they can actually transmit. But when we're talking about the basics here, they'll have a start bit that says, hey, I'm about to send you data. Then it sends the data. And then it sends at the end that stop bit that says, OK, I'm done sending stop. So this is a typical basic frame. When we have a transition, as you can see, one's down here, zero's up here. We have the transitions from a one to a zero, zero or one, depending on the protocol. Um, this is how it knows what information is being, what is being sent to zero or a one. So frames are different based on the protocols, but typically they'll all have a start bit, they'll have some data in there, they'll all have a stop bit, and they will all have something called a parity bit, which we are going to address very shortly. But parity bits are basically a method of error checking, and that's another little section in this presentation that we'll talk about very shortly here. So, so shortly, it's right now. So error detection and or parity. So when you see a parity bit, parity bits are there as a method of checking for errors in the transmitted data. So industrial communication speeds are slow. And the reason that they are slow is that the faster we go, the greater chance we have of errors. Just like a regular conversation, if you talk very fast, there is a chance that you could misunderstand something. So if you communicate more slowly, you'll have less errors. So if we're looking at 1200 bits per second, which is relatively slow in, in today's age when we're sending uh, information over the internet at gigabytes uh, per second, we're talking about a thousand bytes versus millions. So very slow in comparison. So other reasons for errors, um, include electrical noise and device malfunctions. So we have to know if the data that we are receiving is good or not. So in order to do this, we use parity bits. A parity bit is information that is added to the data to enable errors to be detected. Parity bits is, are the most simple form of error checking. And as I said earlier, as we progress, they, they get better and better and they take care of issues that are present in the previous version. So parity, parity bits are very basic um, and they're not typically used um, for higher data transmission speeds, but they do still exist. 
uh, in those systems that use slower transmission speeds. So parity bits can be odd or even, and you'll see in the ILM uh, that they're very quite simple. Okay, so how does the parity bit work? The transmitter will count the number of data bits in the data frame and will set a parity bit to make the total number of bits, the data bits and the parity bits in the frame section equal to the number or type of parity that is selected. And this might not mean much right now if you haven't read the ILM, but basically you can select odd or even parity. It's, it's an option. Um, so if you select odd parity, you add up the number of bits that are in your data plus the parity bit. And if that is, if the data is sent, say it's seven bits, you send seven bits, the receiving end gets seven bits. It looks for odd parity, meaning that it should be getting an odd number. If it's odd, it says the data is good. If you send seven bits and the receiver gets six bits and it's set to odd, it's going to say, hey, hey, I'm getting an even number here. There's got to be an error. So it's really quite simple. Um, the problem is if I send seven bits and the receiver somehow thinks it receives nine bits, it's still going to think the data is good because it's an odd number, but it's not good data because I should only be getting seven bits. So there's a 50% chance of error with parity type error detection. Okay, so parity is the simplest error detection method, but it only catches about 50% of the data errors. It only can tell if it's odd or even. It doesn't count the actual number of bits. If an error occurs in two bits, it won't be able to tell. Even is even, odd is odd. So if a one bit error checker works, which is what parity is, it's one bit, then a multi-bit checker would be better. If we take multi-bits and we put them together, we call it a block check character. And this is building on parity. So parity, very primitive. We evolved technologically into these block check character type error checking devices, which we're, well, we'll talk about next. Okay, the first one is called a checksum. And what a checksum does is it forms a block check character by adding a bunch of bytes together, okay? When received, the sum of the characters or bytes is compared to the block check character and it's verified. So now we're counting all the bits. So we get rid of that shortcoming of parity where it's just looking for odd or even, it doesn't care about the number of bits. Now we're checking to make sure that the actual number of bits is correct. So it's an evolutionary step. So checksums, are over 90% accurate, whereas the parity bit method was only 50% accurate. So you can see we're evolving here. The next style is called a cyclic redundancy check. This is the most effective method uh, listed in the ILM for sure. It uses a method or a chip, which is called the shift register to code data and decode it. And you can read about it in the ILM. It's very fancy, but what you really need to know is basically on the PowerPoint here. CRCs, as we call them, are up to 99.999% accurate. So these are extremely accurate. They are capable of doing much larger data packets in the neighborhood of a few thousand bytes. So much, much more data. And that kind of takes us up to where technology is today. So these are the three different types of error checking methods, parity, checksums, and cyclic redundancy checks. So 50%, 90%, 99.9%. Next thing we're gonna look at is uh, technology in terms of uh, wiring and transmission methods. So we talk about this in terms of balanced and unbalanced transmission. And this refers to the method of referencing the signal to ground. You remember from third year, there was a big thing on uh, shielding and grounding. And you may have noticed the significance of uh, EMF signals overlaying on top of control signals and creating errors. And we talked a lot about having a single point ground so that 
all our devices have the same reference. This speaks to that. So balanced and unbalanced transmissions um, have to do with how they reference that signal to ground, and it is essentially a way to deal with noisy or dirty signals. So we start out again with the primitive version or unbalanced systems, and an unbalanced system is represented uh, by a diagram like this. We send our data through a wire that goes to the receiver. Our receiver and our transmitter are both linked together by a common ground. This is used as a reference for the transmission signal, but if it breaks, I'm not going to have the same ground necessarily be between the transmitter and the receiver. And that's problematic because there could be EMF that affects the signal on either side here, making for bad data. So without continuity on this line, the system will fail, and we call that no ground reference. So this common ground is also a potential source for noise, which means that it has to be short and it has to be slow in order to minimize noise potential. So there is no noise cancellation mechanism in place in an unbalanced system to deal with this problem. And as a result, the system is basically obsolete. And that will lead us into the balanced system. And pay attention on the diagram um, when we switch from unbalanced to balanced here. So balanced, as you see here, <clears throat> signal A and signal B are compared to each other. This eliminates the need for a common ground and also acts as a noise cancellation device called common mode noise rejection. Um, rejection. And this is an important term for you guys to remember. This is the key defining uh, property of a balanced transmission system over an unbalanced transmission system. It, it has this feature called common mode noise rejection. So we compare the signals to both ends on this side here. It transmits, we get the compared signals on both ends. If they compare properly, we accept that signal as the data that we acquired. Balanced transmission is the model for most modern communication systems. So now we are going to look at signal transmission system applications, and we'll start out looking or we'll discuss three different standards and their applications that should answer your questions, Michael. We're going to look at RS-232, RS-485, and USB. There are many, many more of them than this, but these are the ones that we're going to talk about. You will get a pretty good idea of what's going on uh, just by comparing these three here. So RS, in case you care, stands for Recommended Standard Number 232. Okay, these standards are managed by the electrical, or sorry, the Electronic Industry Alliance and are considered to be open source for all people to use. What these standards do is define the electrical and mechanical characteristics of the circuits. So we'll look at RS-232 first. It is the world's most common serial communication standard for point-to-point -point communication. And the best way to remember this is computer, to printer, it's point to point, okay? It's called V24 in Europe, not that we care that much. It's originally designed to connect computers to modems and is therefore considered to be a DTE to DCE standard or terminal equipment to communication equipment standard. So the cable between your computer and your modem. When used to connect two computers together without a modem, is called a null modem connection. And that's an important term as well. Okay, RS-232 defines connection details, including the type of character encoding, the framing of the characters, the type of error detection, and how the data flow control is handled. Uh, data flow control, or sometimes called handshaking, is a way of uh, defining when each side gets to speak. So uh, it's, it's using the stop and start bits uh, or variations of stop and start bits. You'll see as we go through these different types of standards, RS-232, uh, the differences uh, will show up between the different formats, uh, 232, 422, uh, whatever it might be. The differences are gonna be in the encoding, the framing, 
the error detection, and the flow control. So as we go through the different standards, pay attention to what is changing because they're all basically the same, the devil's in the details. Okay, so electrical characteristics of RS-232. See this one here? What type of a system is this? It's got the common ground. Unbounded. So un unbalanced system. Thank you for pretending that you're here. I appreciate that. Otherwise, I'm just talking to myself, and it's weird. Okay, so it's an unbalanced system. So we can say right away that it's unbalanced, and we said earlier that it's obsolete. It is technically obsolete, but it is still used. Okay, one wire carries the voltage, and the other wire carries the reference to ground. And in this situation, noise can be a pretty big issue. And this is why you largely only see RS-232 applications in indoor type non-industrial type applications where there's not a lot of noise so you'll see it still in the office quite a bit because there's not you know motor switching stations mccs big light switchings you know things like that okay communication speeds for rs-232 and again very primitive so we're going to talk about rs-232 first because it's the simplest and it's the oldest and it's the most primitive and as we progress, they get bigger, better, and all stronger, et cetera, et cetera. So speed and distance is limited due to the use of the common ground. The longer the run is, the slower the transmission speed is going to be, and the more susceptible you are going to be to any type of noise. It's just like having a great big long antenna out there. So you'll see if I'm transmitting at 2,400 bits per second, I can run 900 meters of cable, no problem. Slow data speed, long cable. High data speed, 19.2 kilobits, I can only go about 15 meters. So I'm not going to say you have to know all of these numbers, but do understand that the, the longer the cable, the slower the data speed. Um, I am going to test you on some of these numbers, maybe high end or low end, but I'm not going to expect you to remember every single step. But yeah, definitely. Yeah. Go ahead. Is this still for 232? This is still 232, yeah. Okay, so longer wire, slower speeds, more susceptible to noise. Okay, voltage levels, and you're going to see different voltage levels through the different standards, so pay attention to what's going on in this slide here. RS-232 and CPUs operate at different voltage levels. Uh, you may know that uh, computers typically work on a 1 to 5 volt scale. RS-232 uses a different scale. RS-422 uses a different scale. Uh, Different standards use different scales, so that's what we're going to be looking for as we progress through these standards. So in order to use different standards, <clears throat> excuse me, between different devices, we have a, a device called a UART, or a Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter, which sends the data from the CPU to the RS-232 driver, which changes its voltage output to suit the situation. So it'll convert the different voltage levels into suitable signals for the equipment that you're using. For RS-232, and this is worth highlighting here, marks or digital ones are transmitted and recognized as a signal between minus 15 and minus five volts. Spaces are transmitted as a signal between plus 15 and plus five volts. And this represents a zero this represents a one. So transmitters typically and computers typically send using a five volt scale. Um, but the receiver will consider anything on a three volt scale. And I know this is a little bit confusing. We, we have a range available to be used. We're going to use a, a section of that. So elaborating on this plus or minus scale here, 
the distinction that we're going to make in the next point here is although we can send on a five volt scale, I'm sending a signal one to five volts, the receiver can accept a signal that's lower than that. And the reason that the receiver can accept a signal that is lower is because there needs to be a provision for signal loss over the length of the cable that the signal is traveling. Uh, those of you who are electricians uh, will know about line losses. Uh, if I send out five volts on a thousand meter cable, by the time it gets to the other end, it might be four volts. So this is why the transmitter uh, will will use a higher voltage value than the receiver will accept because the receiver has to expect some signal loss in the transmission. And we'll talk about different reasons why there's signal loss in the transmission. As you read through the ILM, these, these values will make more sense to you. Um, but the long short of it is here is as we go between RS-232 and 422, these values here will change. Okay, the full RS-232 standard uh, will list 26 signal functions. And these signal functions are related to the pinouts for the type of cabling. Uh, and they can be grouped into two types of categories. The first type of category here are data signals. And they all identify them specifically for RS-230 as TD and RD, which is transmit data and receive data. And then the other type of signals are called handshaking signals. And the handshaking signals are there to control the flow of data from one device to another and indicate the status of the device in a link. So to make sure that everything is working as it should and that the data is getting back and forth as it should. Okay, some common RS-232 signal names and functions. Um, although RS-232 has 26 possible signal functions, we don't use them all. This list here are the most commonly used ones. Uh, when we do a lab exercise, this will uh, make sense to you. Um, because when we do the pinouts for them, you'll see that these are typically the ones uh, that we use. So uh, nine pin or 25 pin, depending on your application, but don't always use all the pins or all the different functions. These are the most common ones. So RTS, request to send, CTS, clear to send, uh, DSR, data set ready, DTR, data terminal ready, uh, DCD or CD is carrier detect, SG for signal ground, uh, which is the common return for all signals. So these are the most common RS-232 signal functions, all in yellow too, by the way. Okay, RS-232 connectors, you've probably seen both of these or all of these type of connectors here. So a DB25 connector is the original connector. And the reason it has 25 because it has a pin for every available signal. It's a very big connector and it's uncommon because not a lot of devices use all those signals. So why have a big connector? Everything that we do technologically is designed to get smaller and take up less space. So that leads us to the DB9 connector. Um, it's called DB9 because it uses the most common nine signals. It's defined as a sub-miniature type connector and they are available as a male or female. And this is designated by a F or an M in its part code. So example, DB9F would be a female connector. Okay, RJ45, uh, also an RS-232 type connector. This is the same connector used for most, most ethernet connectors. Uh, they look like a big phone jack. So they're cheap, really small, and don't take up much board space. And you can see as we went through here, big connector, smaller connector, and a much smaller connector. So technologically progressing smaller, faster, better. Okay, uh, pin configuration for all of these things is standard, uh, standardized and you can look at the different pinouts uh, on pages 23 or 24 or somewhere in that neighborhood uh, of pages. Okay, connection examples. Uh, connection with modem. Typically, this is what RS-232 is made for. 
And if you look at the diagram on page 25, you'll notice that the connections are straight across. So if you have your ILM handy, uh, flip it to, I think it's around, it's page 25 in my ILM. It might be off by a page or two in yours. But what you want to look for, uh, I don't have the diagram handy, but you'll see that the, the wire connectors go straight across, particularly, particularly between the transmit uh, and receive sections. And the reason we want to highlight that is because when we start talking about null modems, we get some crisscrossing and we're going to approach that here right away. So straight across, when you're looking at the diagram, try to identify that and we'll compare that to uh, the null modem connection, which is a cross-wired connection you'll see on the similar diagram on page 26. So connections that are made with modems, we call null modems. So if you look on page 26, you'll see how the connector is cross-wired. Cross and the reason that they cross, Jesus, I'm getting a lisp here. The reason they are cross-wired is to simulate modem logic. So it's, a bit of, it's basically a way of hot-wiring uh, the communication system to eliminate the need for a modem. Okay, and all, oops, sorry. In all examples, only one signal ground exists. This is the reason that data transmission speeds are lower than other newer RS standards. So did everyone get a chance to look at the diagrams? You can see what I'm talking about there between straight, straight across wiring and cross wiring. And pay attention to that because when we get to the lab, um, when you're doing the lab, we have a variety of different cables uh, that are available. And there's a specific cable called the null modem cable that is pre-crossed internally before it's made. And when you do the lab, if you grab the wrong cable, you're gonna have problems. So remember, when you're doing the lab, things aren't working, check your cable. Do I have a regular cable or do I have one of these special null modem cables? You go ahead. When, like in the real world, would you find something where they would use a null modem uh, cable? Um, well, whenever you don't have a modem, first of all, you wouldn't have, you'd have a no modem cable. So for example, from, uh, I, I'm going to go on a stretch here and I'm not going to say that this is for sure true, but I would say when you're programming an RTU, for example, I would assume that you would be using a no modem cable. Uh, we do use it in the lab because we're, we're programming without a modem. So that's why I'm saying that. Okay, you haven't actually come across it yourself in in your uh, time in the field. No, I I haven't. I'm not a. I never had a lot of experience doing SCADA stuff. Uh, if there's a SCADA guy in the class, they might be able to speak to that. But I can't give you an example myself. I okay. Don't know where that is. But I do know we use it in the lab. So. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough, I guess. Hey. Eh? All right, so whenever we are sending data back and forth, there's going to be configuring involved. It's just like sending a letter to somebody. You have to address it properly. You got to put the stamp in the right spot. You got to put the return address in the right spot. You got to put the, you know, the receiver's address in the right spot. And digital uh, communication is the same the same way. It's got specific things that need to be done and configured. So when we get into uh, talking and using the software, we're going to have to do some configuring. Um, configuring, of course, ensures that we're sending data in the correct format for the receiver and that the receiver is set up in the same format as the transmitter. So typically things that need to be configured will be data speed, the number of bits, the type of parity, uh, the number of stop bits and how data control is handled. And we call this handshaking earlier. And we don't really elaborate too much on handshaking, but we'll give you an example of what it looks like. Okay, so configuring software for asynchronous links relies heavily on what's called the primary serial port configuration rule. And you'll see this is in big red letters here. For any serial communication link to work correctly, the serial ports for all the devices must be configured identically. And you probably have experienced this in real life if you've 
tried to communicate with a, a transmitter or do any type of configuring, it asks you to, to select a COM port. So you'll select a COM port and you'll say connect and it doesn't connect. And that's because you don't have the right serial port selected to match the network that you're trying to configure. So you'll definitely come across this in your life if you haven't yet. So it's something to keep an eye on. Most times in the field when you're having communication issues, this is the issue, is COM port selection. There is at least one exception, of course. If an address must be assigned to a device, each device address must be different. And you can tie this back to heart uh, digital communication. When we're talking digital communication in a heart, it has to be assigned an address from 1 to 15, for example. Uh, when it's non-digital communication, we just set it to a zero, if you remember that from last year. All right, so here's uh, a window out of a software program called Hyperlink, and it used to be pre-installed on old, old computers. Um, I think they changed it now. Most modern computers don't have Hyperlink, but they have something different. But it's the standard that's set up in your computer so that you can, uh, you can do RS-232 connections um, between devices. So this gives you an example of the screen and shows you these configuration parameters that we were talking about last slide. So we've got to set the data speed, drop down menu, it'll have a number of options from 1200 to 1900 to, or 19,200 or whatever it is. Uh, the number of data bits that are in your data frame, uh, the type of parity, whether it's odd or even, the number of stop bits, as we said earlier, uh, flow control, all these are options that are configurable. And you guys will do this exact window uh, in a lab that we do uh, in lab day. So this is configuration. This has to match, transmitter and receiver have to match on each end. So that's RS-232, done. So moving on to the next uh, standard, which is RS-485. And it's quite similar, of course, uh, to RS-232, but technologically advanced. Uh, generally, the changes that you're going to see in the next few slides are changes that are made to overcome the shortcomings that you see in RS-232. So as we go through the next section of slides here, pay attention to what's different between uh, 232 and 485. <clears throat> Okay, very similar to RS-232 with the exception that it is a balanced method. And remember, balanced means that we will have uh, a better signal, less noise, don't have to worry about wires breaking and things of that nature. It also allows for a multi-drop network, which will be a parallel type network. So imagine uh, two lines running parallel across your screen, and then taking a drop off of each of those two lines. So you take a, a positive line and a negative line as a major bus, and then each device comes off that bus with a positive and a negative line. So this is really the way things work for the most part nowadays. So RS-485 can accommodate up to 32 devices, but we again typically don't use that many on a, on a bus. RS-485 is very common in industrial systems uh, like Modbus Plus and other systems here. <clears throat> the RS-485 standard specifies the electrical characteristics, not connectors or flow control. <clears throat> Data speeds and cable lengths are better than RS-232. And RS-485 is available in two-wire and four-wire connection formats. So this is a balanced transmission system, whereas RS-232 is not. And that's a pretty big difference. And the other big difference here is that we add this four-wire connection, and I'll show you what that looks like in the next couple of slides. Okay, so two-wire connection is the most common, and two wires limits us to half-duplex communication. Four-wire connections allow us to have full duplex communication. So this is a big improvement over two wire and an even bigger improvement over uh, just RS-232. 
The next difference that we see between the two standards here is that a marked voltage for 485 is minus 6 to minus 2, and a space voltage is plus 6 to plus 2, or plus 2 to plus 6, depending on how you want to look at that. So good question here is what would be the voltage range or mark voltage range for RS-232? And you would say 5 to 15. If I said, what is it for RS-485? You'd say 2 to 6. Uh, data speeds, as you can see here, quite significantly difference between the two standards here, whereas we were talking about bits per second. In RS-232, we're talking about thousands of bits or millions of bits per second with RS-485. So as a comparison here, 12 meters, we can do 10 million bits per second, whereas the previous one was uh, 15 meters, I think, was it, and 19,200 bits. So pretty major speed change between the two technologies here. Yellow in this table here, 100,000 bits per second at 1,200 meters for RS-485. Okay, signal voltages and something that I didn't show you uh, in RS-232 that probably confused you uh, when I said that you could send a 5-volt signal but the receiver would take a 3-volt signal. This will help you kind of understand that. Uh, using the RS-485 values, it's the same as it would be for RS-232, uh, just the values are different. So you can see here, uh, the transmitted data can be sent as a positive voltage for a zero or a negative voltage for a one, and it'll send a value between negative two and six or positive two and six out. Coming in here on this side, it will accept a lower voltage on the other side. And we call that, that compensation here a noise, uh, a noise margin. And the reason we have this noise margin is because as we transmit, the signal will get weaker depending on the length of the cable. So if I sent five volts out here, for example, it might only be four volts on this side. So we have to have room for it to accept a lower signal. Question? What's the benefit for the negative logic? Why do they use a, a positive voltage for the logic zero and a negative a voltage for the logic one? Um, the, I'm not going to give you a really smart answer for that, but the the basic idea for using positive and negative is sometimes you can get a, a if a voltage doesn't go negative you can have a, an induced voltage that represents a signal uh, just from emf so by going to negative it allows a more defined transition between uh, a one and a zero and that's probably the best answer i'm going to give you I don't know if that's the best answer, Michael, but that's the best answer I can give you. Thank you. Okay, uh, so looking back at our RS-485, uh, different than RS-232 because every signal has its own wire pair rather than that shared ground. This means that it's balanced and again, this is so that we reduce noise errors, and this is called common mode noise rejection. Don't forget that. RS-485 is a balanced transmission system. Here's the next biggest individual point about RS-485, and this is important as we move forward as well, because this is really the state of technology today. RS-485 and many other uh, bus type communication networks, and that's what we're dealing with mostly nowadays is uh, buses, are terminated by a resistor. 
those of you who have uh, dealt with fire protection systems or maybe walked around a commercial building may have seen a, a switch plate on a wall that didn't have a switch in it but had a little icon of a resistor in it. This is called a termination resistor and this is part of the signaling system uh, for a fire protection system, for example. It's part of the signaling system that goes at the end of the run and it's designed to prevent reflected signals on the bus. So termination resistors are something that you're going to see in the field uh, almost all the time now. Anything beyond uh, simple point-to-point -point wiring like you'd normally have a transmitter to a PLC system would be point-to-point. -point. Most plants are still that way, but if you're in a plant that runs a, a bus, whether it's field bus or whether you're using a uh, hard digital bus, these buses will usually have termination resistors and that'll make more sense to you as we as we talk about it more. Um, but very important to, re to remember this termination resistor prevents signal reflections that will degrade the signals. Uh, different protocols will have different values for this resistor but they're typically in the 100 to 200 ohm range and they're tied to the type of cable that you're using. Okay, so again, RS-485 uses lower voltages than RS-232. Remember, we're talking uh, 5 to 15 versus 2 to 6. We are now available to do multi-drop. We have better distance and speed, and we have better noise mitigation. So that's RS-485. Last but not least, USB, or Universal Serial Bus. Technologically, another step beyond RS-485 uh, is also a type of balanced transmission, also uses common mode noise rejection, has higher speeds but shorter distances than the previous two standards, and this operates on a four-wire uh, physical transmission method using two wires for communications and two wires for power. And those of you who have USB devices, you charge your phone with a USB device, for example, so you know that there's power coming through a USB connection. This power is usually limited to around 500 milliamps, and that's probably a good number to remember as well. Go ahead. Is that similar to the CAN bus? To CAN, the C-A-N bus, CAN bus? Yeah. I can't answer that question for you. It is similar though, yes, but they're all similar to CAN bus. CAN bus is kind of the, CAN bus was kind of the grandfather of all of these communication networks. And we do talk about CAN bus briefly uh, at some point in this class. Okay. Uh, USB uses something called a tiered star topology. Um, looking at the graphic might not mean anything to you, but if you think of this in terms of your home computer, uh, you have a number of USB ports on your computer, for example, and if you have more devices, USB devices, then you have ports on your computer. You know, you go out and you buy a, a USB hub and you'll plug that hub into your computer and that'll give you four more outlets. So you could do that with USB a number of different times. So if I have one USB port on my computer, I can plug a four port hub into my computer. That will give me four ports. I can plug another hub into one of those ports. That'll give me another four ports. And I can plug another hub into that hub and it'll give me another four ports. So it's very expandable. And we call that a tiered star topology. Nothing major to take away from this, but I, I just wanted to point that out to you guys. You probably understand that already just from home use. Okay, different types of USB connectors. I'm not testing you on these, um, but you probably all know as we uh, move forward in technology, every manufacturer somehow feels the need to change connectors and make us buy new cords. This is just a snapshot of the multitude of different types of USB connectors that are out there. Um, I'm not going to, I don't have anything important to tell you on these. I'm not going to test you on 
any of these. It's not important for you to know. Uh, just know that there's a multitude of different ones out there. Okay, USB hubs, uh, single port can support up to 127 devices and can supply about 500 milliamps of power. So here's an example of that hub that you would have in that star topology. I have one port on my computer, let's say, then I need four more, so I buy one of these things and now I can plug four things in. If I bought two of these, I could plug another one of them into here and then suddenly I've got seven ports and so on and so forth until I get up to 127. So just a couple of numbers to remember here, up to 127 devices and about 500 milliamps of power provided. That is the end of the first section for signal transmission systems. Here's a quick little picture of uh, a type of a terminal resistor. Um, when you come into the shop, I'll show you a terminal resistor that's built into a field bus network. Um, it's part of the hardware that resides inside of the cabinet. Um, they have many different configurations. Like I said earlier, a fire protection system has them mounted in a, in a receptacle box on, on the wall. So there's different types, but they're all uh, related to a, a, signal, uh, a signal transmission system that uses a bus type of topology. So we'll talk about those again in another, in another section. So it's 10 after 10. There's two ILMs in this uh, section. So we'll take a little break here um, to go to the washroom, have a smoke, whatever you need to do. We'll come back in about 10 minutes and I'll do this second uh, PowerPoint for this section. Good? Right on, man. Thanks. Hello, will you send uh, another email for the lab schedule confirmed in February? Yeah, I will before the end of the day. I'll send a, I'll send out an email. I still have to check with room bookings to make sure I can book that week, but I'm pretty sure I'll I'll do that today. Okay, yeah, once I receive that confirmation, I can reschedule my lab schedule as well accordingly. All right. Thank you.